each of you here. And I want to welcome our friends who are also watching via satellite or television or Facebook right now. And uh, we're living in very interesting times. I think it's important that we declare to you the whole counsel of God. And today would be one of those subjects that um, could be misunderstood unless I give a little preface and explain. There are some things in the Bible that are uh, some strong statements. And we're going to be sharing today some of the strongest statements that Jesus made uh, that are given to us as warnings in love. But uh, uh, I hope that you'll just take it in the spirit that it's given. But it's something that we, I think, need to consider because, uh, well, eternal life depends on it. Uh, getting some things wrong can cost you eternity. Now before I get into the message in particular, I want to just talk about oxymorons. You all know what an oxymoron is? Don't feel bad if you don't. I remember when I heard it mentioned, I thought, I don't know what an oxymoron is. Oxymoron is a couple of words that you put together that, you know, it might be a popular phrase, and the two words are actually opposites. Like jumbo shrimp would be an oxymoron. Um, civil disorder. Well, civil and disorder are total opposites. An elevated subway. A holy war. Sometimes we have programs that say recorded live. Well, if it's recorded, it's not live. Um, a mud bath is an oxymoron. Government productivity <laughs> is another example of that. Instant water. A black light, a working vacation, a light heavyweight, <laughs> criminal justice, um, good grief, civil war. I've got a long list. I'm not going to read them all to you because it would just take too long. Inside out, pretty ugly. Pretty uglies, you know. It's kind of opposite. Silent protest. Uh, what do we got? Rap music? Uh, <laughs> what did you say? Female driver? No, no, you can't say that. No, no, no. <laughs> A resident alien? <laughs> A death benefit? <laughs> A dry lake? Tight slacks? Silent alarm? You know, I like uh, oxymorons. I've got a collection, as you can tell. Whenever I hear a new one, I try to add it to my list. Our sermon today is based on an oxymoron. And it's called a sincere hypocrite. Because hypocrisy, of course, is the antithesis of sincerity. But, you know, the Bible has quite a bit to say about hypocrisy. And it's something we need to pray that God will help us recognize and guard against. Now what is hypocrisy? Well, hypocrisy comes from a Greek word that really talks about uh, the theater in ancient Greece, even before the time of Christ, when actors got out on the stage and they assumed different parts, they had these masks that they put up. And one actor might wear several different masks. And at one point he'd come out and he'd hold his mask and have a big happy face on it. You've probably seen some examples of this in art, the Greek mask. And, and uh, then when he was angry, He'd have an angry face and all of a sudden if the devil should appear he'd pick up the devil face and then if there was an angel, same actor would then put on the angel face and he'd go through his lines and everyone would know when he held the angel face this is the angel speaking. And so the idea of one person changing among many different masks is where you get this word hypocrites or, or hypocrite and it's talking about a person who is able to just sort of uh, convey something that isn't authentic, isn't really them. The practice Here's a hypocrite. The practice of professing beliefs, feelings, or virtues that one does not really hold or possess. Falseness. Being two-faced. Play acting. To make a pretense. It's found about 40 times in the Bible. That's including the word hypocrite and hypocrisy in case you do a search. You know, I understand on the Italian Riviera that uh, it's very desirable if you could have a home facing the Mediterranean. Uh, some of the homes are very old 
and they were not built with balconies and everybody wants a balcony on their home but because of the ancient architecture balconies could not affordably be added to some of these homes and so what the creative owners did is they got artists to paint balconies on their house and so and to make it look real some of them would even paint laundry hanging from their balcony to give it that authenticity but you could never stand on that balcony it was a facade sometimes Christians paint on our religion and it's not real and we're all at risk of sometimes being a little bit hypocritical how many of you have heard someone say I'm not going to church because it's just full of hypocrites you ever heard that before? I think I heard it last week and I like to always say you should still come there's always room for one more because <laughs> um, let's face it we all sometimes deal with being authentic and at the heart of what I want to say today in case you miss it or drift off it's an appeal that we should be genuine that a religion must be a heart religion the most scathing rebukes that Jesus made it was not against the publicans and the harlots and the sinners it was against false religion people who were having a pretense of being uh, something that they really weren't now some reasons that uh, people get involved in hypocrisies are trying to make an impression um, first of all it's not wrong to want to make a good impression a lot of you would never be married if you didn't know how to try to make a good impression um, and if people are visiting we want to make a good impression you want to be positive Jesus said let your good works so shine before men that they may glorify your father in heaven so why are you making the good impression is the question is it you're doing it to glorify you or is it to glorify your father in heaven and when the idea is trying to impress others with ourselves that's not the Christian virtue now in Matthew 23 you find some of Christ's strongest statements against hypocrisy As a matter of fact if you've got your Bibles you might want to jump there real quick Matthew 23 I'm not going to read the whole chapter we'd be here a while but you just it's hard to believe sometimes Jesus speaking so forcefully but he says several times he first he addresses the scribes and the Pharisees so you're going to hear us talk a lot about Pharisees today I should pause explain when the children of Israel were carried off to Babylon because of their idolatry and their unfaithfulness seventy years later they were able to come back when they came back some of the religious leaders said we don't want to ever make that mistake again so God withdraws his blessing and we are carried away and so they became very regimented in their religion to compel everybody to make sure that they are faithful not only was idolatry never a problem again they had laws about how to keep the Sabbath with great precision they had laws about um, you know, washing before you eat and all the ceremonies and the rigors of religion and they kept adding laws and it got to where some of the religious leaders were uh, proud of that they were more religious than the other religious leaders and it became an Olympic competition and this happened over a couple hundred years where they developed a sect called the Sadducees talking about the purified ones and uh, they just took religion to a whole new level and it all became external to advertise how pious and holy they were I remember when I was in India years ago periodically you'll see holy people that would be sitting on the street and uh, the way they are demonstrating they're holy is that they humble themselves by sitting in dirt and ashes and wearing rags and occasionally a tourist would walk by and want to get a picture because they look so scary. I know Tim you've been there and we have some of our evangelists that have been there these people they live, they, look, they look like just a cake of ash and dirt and rags that you just you want to get a picture because it was such an amazing fact but you take out your camera and they say just one moment please and they want to rearrange their ashes make a good impression of their piety but so sometimes people try to impress others with their religion so Jesus he spoke out against the scribes and the Pharisees and you can read in the first few verses Jesus spoke to the multitudes and the disciples and he said the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses seat they were the religious leaders therefore whatever they tell you observe 
and do, but not according to their works, for they say, and they do not. For they bind heavy burdens on men, on their shoulders, but they themselves will not lift them with one of their fingers. All their works they do to be seen by men. That pretty much sums it up. If your religion is for demonstration of what others think, it's vain. And you can go on and you can read here, for instance, in uh, chapter 23, verse 13, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 16, he just says, Woe to you, blind guides. You go on to verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 27, Woe to you, hypocrites. Verse 29, Woe to you, hypocrites. The word hypocrite, I think, is found seven times in this chapter. Interesting number. And he says, Woe to you, I think, eight times. But this is the strongest language that Jesus speaks. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, when he begins preaching, he addresses the problem with the hypocrisy among the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, you're going to hear a little bit about the Pharisees in the message today. If you look in Matthew 23, verse 4, not only does it say they bind heavy burdens on men, it says all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. Now, the phylactery, if you hear that word, you might go, what's a phylactery? Moses said, these words I command you today shall be in your heart, you shall bind them for a sign on your hand, they will be frontlets between your eyes. And so you've probably seen pictures before, I think we've got one we're going to put up on the screen here. Um, that, uh, yeah, go ahead, put that picture on the screen that I see on my screen for the people in the studio. Hello? There we go. You can see around their wrists they'd wrap these levered tongs and there would be a piece of scripture on a box on their right hand and then on their forehead, actually that picture's flipped around, it's supposed to be on the right hand. On their forehead they'd have a little box that had scripture in it. No, Moses didn't mean, and God did not mean for them to take elements of scripture and tie it to their forehead or tie it to their hand. He meant have it in your head, have it in your actions, and have it in your heart. Obviously in the heart was a figure of speech. But they took it literally and they put these phylacteries, they still wear them today, the Orthodox Jews, on their hands and on their heads. And he said they'd make wide the borders of their garments because the priest was told to have a border of blue to show his loyalty to the law. And so the priests all have, you'll see it in illustration, they had a border of blue. Well, if someone had a little border of blue, one priest would say his border is wider than my border. Well, I'm going to make my wide, my border of blue wider than his border. Pretty soon they were wearing these, dragging around these long borders of blue to show I'm more loyal than they are. And so all of it began to be sort of a, a show of who could be the most religious. They enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost seats in the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, Ph.D. It was all about your position. I think it was Spurgeon said we should not be proud of face or place or race. And it was all about their office and they wanted that. They were worried about what everyone else thought of them and so it was all outward religion. But you know, you're not very happy when you're living to try to always impress other people. I remember years ago when I was living on the Navajo Reservation, I talked to a friend and he told me that when he was growing up, he and his friends always felt a little insecure that they were poor and the Belaganas, the white men, were rich. And when they went into Farmington, they couldn't afford air conditioners in their cars. So they would roll up their windows anyway in the summertime, 100 degrees. They drive around with their windows rolled up. They try to look cool until they got out of town. Suffering because they were afraid others would think they're poor Indians that couldn't afford air conditioning. And when he told me this, he just laughed. He said, you know, we were so worried about what they thought of us. Do we ever worry about what people think? make ourselves miserable trying to live up to other standards? See, for the Christian it boils down to really uh, two questions. We all kind of live, live to try to impress. The question is, who do you want to impress? Are you living because you're concerned about what God thinks of you? Or are you living because you're concerned about what people think of you? 
it's really, for the Christian, it's all got to be about the God and what he sees. If you're living for men, the only reward you're going to get is the praise of men and then you're lost forever. But if you're living for the glory of God to impress God because you love God, that reward is eternal. That's the bottom line, what we're saying. But in order to do that, it's got to be coming from the heart. It's got to be heart interest. Have you ever tried to pretend to be someone you didn't, or have you ever tried to pretend to like someone you didn't really like? Because maybe some advantage or sometimes you're just being polite. Some people do that with God. They pretend to love God. Paul described this as a problem in the last days. 2 Timothy 3.1 But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Now I want to stop right here. You might be thinking, yeah, the world's really going to be wicked in the last days. Look at what Paul just described. He wasn't talking about the world. The world has always been that way. He's talking about the church. Notice the next thing he says. Having a form of godliness. They got the outward form of godliness, but denying the power. They don't have the inward heart change, but they got forms of godliness. This is a problem all over the world. People that have forms of religion, but there's no inner transforming power. This is a condition he describes in the church. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the inside. We often live because we're worried about what man sees and we forget about what really matters. What does God see? Are we genuine? I catch myself being a hypocrite. I'm just telling you right up front. But I'm not terribly ashamed to say that publicly because whether you know it or not, you are too sometimes. But we got to get the victory over that. I'm not saying it and saying, oh well, we're all hypocrites. No. We've got to really evaluate, are we doing things for the glory of God? Are we worried about what everyone thinks? Do we ever put on a religion to try to just look good? Hypocrisy is one of the most dangerous attitudes for a Christian. Jesus spoke the strongest against it. We all sometimes wear masks. Somebody once said, hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays to virtue. It's pretty profound when you think about that. Oswald Chambers said, the world is glad for an excuse to ignore the gospel message and the hypocrisy of Christians is their favorite excuse. Now hypocrisy does not just appear in the New Testament because it's a Greek word. Hypocrisy is addressed in the Old Testament. Look real quick if you will. First chapter of Isaiah. He dives right in. Isaiah is sort of like the Old Testament gospel and he doesn't spare any punches. Go to verse 12, okay? When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts, to bring no more futile sacrifices, incense is an abomination to me, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity. He says you're going through the religious things, but it's coming from iniquity. And the sacred meeting, your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates, they are trouble to me. I am weary of burying them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide, that means when they would pray and they'd spread out their hands. I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Then he says, here's the solution. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke, rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. And the understanding here is no matter how many prayers you pray, no matter how many offerings you sacrifice, no matter how many times you show up in the temple for the various feasts and Sabbaths, if your hearts aren't cleansed by the gospel, it's smoke in his nose, is what the Bible says. The Lord wants us to be real Christians. As I quoted a minute ago, Oswald Chambers said, the world is always... Doesn't the media love to find a hypocrite Christian? They'll hold that forth and they'll say, oh, 
you know, if this is how the Christians are acting, then I'm still safe not going to church because they're just all hypocrites. The devil is scared of nothing more than genuine Christians that are really changed from the inside out. Now, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you can read in Matthew 5, 6, 7. Going to Matthew 6, and you start with the first few verses, Jesus talks about the hypocrites. He gives three examples of hypocrisy. He talks about hypocrisy in praying, in giving, in fasting. They represent three different things. One of the examples of his hypocrisy is for others, the giving for others. One is to God, and one is to ourselves, praying to God, fasting for ourselves. And it's possible, possible to be a hypocrite in all of these categories. Look, for instance, at the, the giving. Go to Matthew 6, verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they might have glory of men. Now, he's not just talking about the Pharisees, but people back then, they'd, they'd uh, want to announce, all right, I'm going to make a big donation. Uh, you, you got the cameras? You all looking this way? Here, I'm, gonna, I'm writing this big check. I'll make a big one so you can all see it. And put all these zeros in here. And why are they doing it? They want everyone to clap and go ooh and ah and say, look, I got this brick in the building. It's named after me. And they're, are they giving because they love the project? They love the mission? They love the individual? They're just wanting to help the hungry person? Or they're wanting the praise of men? This is what Jesus is saying here. It says, when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand, that's supposed to be your you know, carnal side, your selfish side, know what your right hand is doing. Don't be exploiting your good deed, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, He will reward you openly. So Christ is saying, if you're doing your gift because you want the praise of men, well, you may get the praise of men, but that's all you get. But if you're doing it because you care about the project and the person or whatever you're giving to, then do it secretly. Do it humbly. Don't be a spectacle. You remember uh, a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira? They said they were going to make a donation and they lied and said, we're giving all that we've got. And they lied. They gave some of it and they kept back. They dropped dead. Why did God deal with them so severely? because this is right after the Holy Spirit poured out, this was the infancy of the new Christian church and God wanted to make it clear, let's not play games, do not be a hypocrite, be genuine, be honest, if you can't give then don't give, but don't pretend to be something you're not. I mean, can you get the idea of how strongly God must feel about this? He wants us to give in uh, sincerity and in truth. You got pretentious praying. Jesus said, verse 5, in Matthew 6, verse 5, and when you pray, you notice he didn't say if you pray, <laughs> he says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrite. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they might be seen of men to pray. I surely say they have the reward. All the reward they're getting is God's not answering their prayer. They're just getting the praise of people thinking they're pious. That'd be pretty sad. You know the parable Jesus shares. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a publican. They're the tax collectors. They were the mafia, the sinners. And the other was the, uh, the Pharisee. The Pharisee, he goes up front and he stands and he prays with himself and says, Lord, I thank you I'm not like other men. And he's praying out loud because the prayer is recorded. Someone heard it. And I uh, pay tithe of all I have. I fast twice a week and I'm glad I'm not like this extortioner on the back row. And so he's praying to make an impression. And God says, uh, publican, he would not so much as lift up his eyes, but he bowed his head, he smote on his breast, he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus said at the end of that service, only the publican went home forgiven. Because he was praying from his heart. The Pharisee's prayer, it was all a charade. It, it was all a show. It was a mask. Our prayers need to be genuine. Micah 3 verse 4, Then they will cry to the Lord, but He will not hear them. He will even hide His face from them at that, at that time, because they have been evil in their deeds. God wants us to be real. What does the Lord require of thee? Thousands of sacrifices to give the firstborn? Rivers of oil? It says, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. 
Matthew 23, 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. They were greedy. They would take advantage of uh, the poor. And for a pretense, you'd make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Francis Bacon said, A bad man is worse when he pretends to be a saint. So, here you've got these religious leaders that were exploiting the poor, taking advantage of the widows and, and getting all of their funds and then they just they say, well I'll cover it up because I'll make a long prayer. You know, in the Bible sometimes the longest prayers were not the most effective. Elijah prayed for 30 seconds and fire came down. Now, I think your private prayers ought to be long prayers. Public prayers should be short prayers especially if you're in worship where you get people on their knees and, uh, and their knees are old or kids that are squirming. Uh, but ha have you seen it before where people pray and they're not really, it doesn't sound like they're talking to God, it's like they're praying because they're trying to impress people that are listening. They use these words, you got to get a dictionary to find out what in the world they just said. And or maybe they're preaching in their prayer, they're making statements for the benefit of those listening. Prayer should be to God. He says, be real in your prayers. And then he talks about phony fasting. Matthew 6.16 Moreover, when you fast, again I want you to notice, he doesn't say if you fast. Some people think, well fasting, yeah that was back in Bible times. Still a good idea to fast and pray. So he said, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they might appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. So back then the Pharisees, when they were going through fasting, they would just twist up their face and they'd try to look as gaunt as they could and they'd walk real slow and people would say, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fasting. Because it was considered very religious. I had a friend came to visit me one day and uh, I said, yeah, you want to go grab a bite to eat? We can talk some more. He said, sure, let's go. And we sat down and I ordered. I said, what do you want? He said, oh, I'm fasting. I thought, we didn't have to come here. I said, now I've got to eat in front of you while you're fasting. He said, you make me feel guilty. He stared at my food the whole time I'm eating. I knew he wanted it. But he said, no, no, that's okay. I'm praying about something. I'm going <laughs> just made me uncomfortable. <laughs> he said, but when you fast, wash your face, comb your hair, assuming you have hair, and be cheerful. So your fasting is between you and God. If you're fasting so people will be impressed with, with um, your religion, alright, that's your reward. You get a trophy from people. He's a great faster. But your fasting is not accomplishing anything between you and God. I remember when I was a kid, um, they were making Volkswagen bugs, the old ones back then. Some company made a lot of money because they dreamed up the, these attachments you could put on your VW Beetle. And your know, bug was about the cheapest car you could buy. They had a Rolls Royce hood you could put on your beetle. I see Steve nodding, you remember? Or you had a Mercedes conversion kit. They were fiberglass, but you'd, it would be like a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce on the outside, but it's just a Volkswagen bug underneath. That's kind of like hypocrisy. <laughs> Try to look like something that it's not. What does God want? Psalm 51 verse 6, Behold, here it is, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God wants us to be honest and true on the inside. You know why this is important? What's on the inside will come out. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and so if you want to be honest in your speech you need to be sincere in your heart. You know where the word sincere comes from? It's a, a Greek word, or maybe it's Latin, I just know it means without wax. What is it? Latin, Latin. yeah. I, it, it, because back in, uh, the sculptors would sometimes use inferior marble when they were sculpting and there'd be a little crack that would appear. And they would want to hide that there was a crack in the idol they made and so they'd push wax into it. And they, they'd press the wax in there and they'd sell it and it looks like it's good but then when it got hot eventually the wax discolored, it would melt out and and so when they sold a good statue that was authentic, it would say it was sincere. It was without wax plugging the cracks. And so when you sign a letter sincerely, that'll take on new meaning now, right? And so God wants us to be sincere in our speech. That means you must be sincere in your heart. Matthew 15, 7, Jesus, 
Red letter. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me. Now that right there, I don't know if that jumps out at you like it does at me. You know what vain means. It's a waste of time. For God to say that someone might worship him in vain should arrest our attention. Because if you're like me, you ought to be asking, Lord, is it I? Um, am I worshiping you in vain? How do you worship God in vain? By drawing near with your lips when you don't mean it with your mouth. You're talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk. He wants both. It says, In vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. James 3 verse 8, still talking about talking. But no man can tame the tongue, it's unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless God and the Father, and with the same tongue we curse men, who've been made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? We want our words to be genuine, sincere, pure all the time. Some people come to church and they sing one song and then they get around their friends and they start cursing. Out of the same mouth, blessing and cursing. Aesop said, I'll have nothing to do with a man who can blow hot and cold with the same breath. Outside show is a poor substitute for inner worth. He told a lot of children parables, but he said some profound things. One pastor said, we sometimes don't really mean the words we sing. We sing onward Christian soldiers, and we wait to be drafted. We sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, and we barely use the one we have. We sing, there will be showers of blessings, and we don't come to church when it rains. We sing, blessed be the tie that binds, and the least little offense will sever it. We sing, I love to tell the story, but we never mention it to our friends. We sing, marching to Zion, but we can't manage to walk to Sabbath school. I changed the last part there. Yet some songs we could sing, if we were to be honest, we'd be saying, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like you. <laughs> There's a Chinese proverb that says, One foot cannot stand in two boats. You know, Jesus made a statement about tombs. It was in our scripture reading. It says in Matthew 23, we keep going back to that passage. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all manner of uncleanness. Even so outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. How does God see it when we have the facade of religion, but our hearts are corrupt? Years ago I went to uh, Egypt and I saw King Tut's treasures. And when Howder, Howard Carter first discovered King Tut's tomb, I think it was 1921, that they unsealed the first tomb and they went in this great stone cut room and then there was this big coffin. And they opened up the coffin, there was a gold box and then it was another gold box and another gold box and there was like a nest of seven coffins. And then they had this beautiful, it's a masterpiece, uh, this one coffin's got 240 pounds of gold studded with gems. And then they lift that off, they got this priceless, you've seen the face mask of King Tut. It's considered one of the most priceless artworks. It's almost perfect. Gold. And then they took that off the mummy and it was wrapped in some uh, cloth that had some gold in it. And then finally they took that off and you know what they found underneath it all? Here's a picture of King Tut. Come on, in the studio, time means everything. <laughs> So all that gold is surrounding, he was a young king actually, he doesn't look very young right now, he died at about 19 years of age. But all that gold and all that beauty and all that art is surrounding a rotten, withered mummy. <laughs> this is what Jesus is talking about if we've got all the, the beauty in our religion and we don't have the heart change. He says, this is what I see. He says, what does he want? Christ said, Pharisee, 
you clean the outside of the cup and you don't clean the inside. Now if you are going to go to someone's house and they tell you, you know, I've got a problem, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit uh, conflicted, I can't ever make up my mind whether to wash the inside or the outside of my dishes, what are you going to want to hear? That they wash the outside or the inside? If you're going to be drinking from their cup, do you just want the outside clean or do you especially want the inside clean? Well, this is how the Lord is. He said, look, if you've got to choose between the two, I don't care about the outside as much as the inside. Now it's okay for you to be good on the outside too. But start with the inside. Because if the heart has changed, the words have changed, the life has changed, everything changes. Pastors struggle all the time trying to change the outward behavior of members. And they don't get anywhere. If people can grasp the goodness of the gospel and the heart has changed, everything else changes. When the people go through a real revival and their hearts are, and they're born again, and they're made new creatures, offerings change, conversation changes, service changes, all the things that you struggle as a pastor trying to change in a church, it all changes when they get the gospel. It's got to start on the inside. So why do people, why do we sometimes pretend to be what we're not? Well, like Jesus said, sometimes we're trying to make a big impression. We're worried about what people think. You know, oftentimes it's fear. People do hypocritical things because they're afraid. A few examples. David, 1 Samuel 21. He heard that Achish realized who he was. It says, when David heard these words, he was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. He was a Philistine king. So he changed his behavior. David, who was brilliant and very self-possessed, he pretended he was crazy, he scratched on the doors, he let his spit go down his beard. Now, let's, he was pretending to be something he wasn't. Why? Because he was afraid. Why did Abraham pretend that Sarah was just his sister? He's afraid. He said, she's so beautiful, they might kill me. So I tell you what, let's make a deal. Wink, wink, he tells Sarah. Let's just say it's the brother-sister. I mean, after all, we do have the same father, different mothers. But let's not make a big deal out of the husband-wife relationship. Let's pretend. It's even just partial hypocrisy. You've heard of a half-truth before? If you've got a half-truth, what's the other half? And so, why? He was afraid. God, to Sarah, God says to Sarah, You laughed when you heard my prophecy and my promise. She said, Oh, I didn't laugh. Because she was afraid. She did laugh. Why did Isaac say that uh, Rebekah was his sister? He was afraid of the Philistines. Peter, Jesus said, Peter said, I'll not deny you, even though all of these deny you. I'll never deny you. And he may have even meant it then, but why did he end up denying Jesus? He was afraid. What was he afraid of? Did he, was he afraid that servant girl was going to beat him up? No, he was afraid of what they thought. He was afraid, all of a sudden Jesus had become very unpopular. Peter had a problem with wanting to be popular. And when Jesus was no longer popular, when Jesus was popular, Peter was right there, as chief bodyguard. He was right at his side. He wanted to help distribute the, you know, the visits with Jesus. And, and all of a sudden when everyone was mocking Jesus, Peter said, I swear I have never seen him before. Why did he do it? He was afraid. You know, it even says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, even after Peter was converted, he backslid a little bit. Just to give you the story, the Jews were very careful about obeying certain laws. They didn't like the association with the Gentiles. God told Peter, look, do not call the Gentiles unclean. I've cleansed them. They can all be saved just like you. But when Jews came to visit Peter up in um, Asia, and Peter had been living with the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles, hanging out with the Gentiles just like it should be, but when the Jews came, he thought, well, what will they think of me? And he started to withdraw from them and just hang out with the Jews. And it was basically, it was discrimination, a little racism, you might say. Now listen to what Paul says. Paul, Galatians 2.11, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, down in Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing those, there you got it again. Why did he do it? afraid, fearing those who were of the circumcision, the Jews. And the rest of the Jews who had already been up there with Peter, they joined him in his hypocrisy. Even Barnabas got carried away with their hypocrisy. 
Well, it's good news in the hope that if Jesus can convert fishermen, he can convert us. So, does it bother you that there's hypocrites in the church? I'm more concerned about hypocrisy in me. Um, it's sort of human nature sometimes to put on a show. Christians need to get the victory over that. But it shouldn't bother you in that, do you counterfeit a nickel? Have you heard of counterfeit $20 bills? I actually had one. I always wonder if I say that the FBI is going to come looking for me. I, saw, I picked one up because someone tried to trade it. Uh, counterfeit $20 bill. You'll find counterfeit $100 bills. I've never seen a counterfeit nickel. You know why? It's not worth it. What do you counterfeit? You counterfeit things that are valuable. Why does the devil have so many counterfeit Christians? Because nothing is more valuable in the world than a real Christian. That's why you've got so many counterfeits. And so it shouldn't surprise us. Don't be discouraged. Paul says we need to be real. Romans 2.21 Thou therefore that teachest another, do you teach yourself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, do you steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Jesus said it's not just the action, it can be the attitude if a man is thinking it in his heart. You not only murder physically, you can murder in your mind. If you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. You not only lie with an outright lie, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So it's not just the actions. He wants us to have inner uh, honesty and worth. Now why is it so important that we understand what it means to be a hypocrite? Hypocrites aren't going to make it. I know I've just told you I struggle with it. I know many of you struggle with it. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Would you be willing to nod? What's the reward of the hypocrite? Luke 12 verse 6. It tells us if you read Luke 12 verse 6 through 10, hypocrisy offends the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you look at that passage, Luke 12 verse 6 through 10. Now, I don't have time to read all those passages. Job 8 13. So, the path, so is the path of all who forget God and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. Now there's hope for you and me right now. But someday, in the end when the Lord comes, Job 20 verse 5, The triumphing of the wicked is short. The joy of the hypocrite is just for a moment. It's the praise of men. Job 34 30, The hypocrite should not reign. We will not live and reign with Christ. And finally, listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 24 51, The master of that ser servant will come on a day he's not looking for him, an hour he's not aware of, will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is that pretty clear where the hypocrites are going to end up? That's why it's important that we talk about this because Jesus talks about it. But there is hope for us. Can a Pharisee be saved? Did Jesus save any Pharisees? You know, around the time of the cross, several Pharisees came out of the closet. Do you know why Nicodemus met with Jesus at night? He was a Pharisee. He was afraid of what the other Pharisees would think. But when Jesus finally died on the cross, he got over his fear and he came to uh, take care of the body. Joseph of Arimathea, you don't ever hear about him until Jesus dies. All of a sudden, he comes out of the closet and he decides he's going to be real. He was more worried about what God thought than what the other Pharisees thought that had just con condemned Jesus. And it says, Joseph went boldly to Pilate and asked for his body. Pilate thought, I thought you Pharisees wanted him dead. Now you want to honor him. I don't understand. Joseph was bold. And then you know, another famous Pharisee, his name is Saul of Tarsus, later called Paul. Let me read this to you. Acts 23, 6. But Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees, the other were Pharisees. He cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Acts 26, 5. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now you know what that means? That half of the New Testament was written by a Pharisee that was converted. So is there hope for a hypocrite? 
What happened to Paul? Paul ran into Jesus on the road to Damascus and his heart was changed. He was thoroughly converted. He spent a lot of time on his knees pretty fasted and prayed for three days. And once he really got a hold of the real thing, well you know, this, you, you, you've got to understand that even those who are a little hypocritical, they know there's value in the real thing and they're trying for the real thing, but instead of worried first about what God thinks, they're worried about what men think. Now, Gospel summed up, and I'm, I'm concluding with this. Gospel summed up in two things. Love for God and love for your neighbor. What comes first? First, come unto me. Matthew 11 comes before Matthew 28. It's first this love relationship. If we will start with what does God think of me? And then when we get that right, then we live before other people so they'll glorify our Father in Heaven. We want to be good examples, but it's got to start with, is God the most important? Because if we're more worried about men than God, then the day's going to come, you'll have to decide, do I obey the commandments of men or the commandments of God? And you will obey the commandments of men to get the praise of men, and you'll end up getting the mark of the beast. Does that make sense? It's got to be this love relationship first that governs this love relationship. Being more interested in what he thinks knowing his camera's always rolling as opposed to what everyone else thinks. I want to be a real Christian. I mean that. I want it to be in my heart. I want to be the same person when nobody's watching. That's what integrity is. To be consistent. Don't you want to have that kind of experience? In the meantime, be a good example. But let's pray we're doing it for the right reason. Amen? You know, I think it'd be good to close with, uh, I've got a song. We don't often sing this, but it's got a beautiful melody. And it's 187. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. You know, that sinner, he smote on his breast, said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus forgave him. We want to have that experience. Let's stand as we sing. out there?
pray the Lord will help us be genuine from the inside out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you are a friend of sinners and that we can come to you like that publican did and just say, Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to be born again. Give us new hearts. I pray that we will treasure your approval and will live remembering that we live in your sight. And then, Lord, help us to be good witnesses, but to be doing it for the right reason. I pray your blessing that each person here will know how to apply this message. We know Jesus said some very strong things, and we know that it's an appeal of life that he presents to us. Help us to respond. Pray, Lord, that you'll be with us now through this Sabbath day. Uh, bless the music program this evening, that it might be a means of witnessing to the community. And we pray all this will bring glory to you. Ask this for Christ's sake. Amen.